You are now listening to the Unscripted Ohio Podcast, brought to you by Buckeye Grove. For all the latest Buckeyes news, analysis, reaction, and the best Ohio State community on the entire internet, head over to BuckeyeGrove.com or follow us on Twitter at Ohio State Rivals. Without any further delay, it's time to get unscripted. Broadcasting from Podcast Central, a place that is not his mother's basement. Hey, Ma, can we get some meatloaf? We promise. Here's your host, Kyle Lamb. Hey, Ma, the meatloaf. Good Friday to you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another edition of the Unscripted Ohio Podcast. I am your host, Kyle Lamb. We are brought to you by BuckeyeGrove.com. Thanks for joining me. A little bit uh, more I want to add on the special edition I had yesterday talking about the Urban Meyer suspension and the Gene Smith suspension as well. I know a lot of you are asking, is there more coming? Um, I think it's safe to say that we haven't heard the last of the story. Uh, I'm going to get into what I think may or may not happen going forward. Have we heard the last of this? I'll talk about that. Also, coming up today... Mark Gibbler will be along. Uh, He's going to add some some of his thoughts on the craziness of the last couple days, especially the the circus that was in town on Wednesday. We'll talk about how Ohio State handled that. And, of course, Mark's expertise is really about football recruiting. And we'll kind of get in a little bit to more detail about how this has impacted Ohio State's football recruiting efforts and what we can expect going forward. And later in the show, a little bit of basketball information that got buried, not Ohio State related, but interesting tournament information. If you're a college basketball fan, you probably have heard about the RPI, which stands for the Ratings Percentage Index. That is the number. It's kind of a winning percentage based statistic that has been around in college basketball since 1981. That was finally put on its deathbed the other day. Wednesday, actually, it was announced officially they're going to be doing away with that and bringing in a new statistic to measure and compare teams with. I will explain that later in the show if you are fascinated. Not going to take a long time on it, but it is interesting into how they are going to uh, change and replace measuring teams for the NCAA tournament. So hope you will find that fascinating, but that'll be coming up after Mark later in the show. So what a lot of you are asking, and I'm cut to to some extent, I'm asking this myself. What is a reasonable expectation for all of this craziness going forward? Like, have we heard the last of the drama is Ohio state, out of the woods. The most common thing I've seen post suspension since we, we found out Wednesday evening that urban Meyer was going to be serving a three game suspension. A lot of people are bringing up, Hey, Jim Tressel originally was going to be serving a four game suspension. And then he wound up being fired. Um, I don't think it's safe to compare the two situations because although there were some similarities there, we did think we knew what happened with Jim Trestle in that case. It turns out more information came out and he wasn't being truthful. In this particular case, I think the difference was there was an investigation here. They looked into Urban Meyer's emails They had a paper trail of some conversations that corroborated what he knew on the incidents and what he didn't know. Uh, I think we've established, at least as it pertains to Zach Smith and his domestic allegation involving Courtney Smith, I think we know that we know the extent of Urban's knowledge for the most part. I mean, we don't know for sure if he was passed along that text message that Shelly allegedly had with Courtney Smith. Uh, we don't know details like that. We just we can't say for sure. But we do know, I think, that Urban knew about the allegation in 2015. He was forthcoming with, with investigators about that. 
we have a pretty good idea of when he knew it, how much he knew. Uh, investigators seem to establish some things we did not know previously and, and that Urban did not know previously, such as uh, Zach Smith's 2013 DUI. Uh, or I think it was later reduced to a, um, an OBI. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. It was actually reduced to uh, physical control. But that was later reduced. It turns out Urban did not know about that. Um, it, it turns out he did not know about the May criminal trespass until later, until right around the time this all broke. I think a week week or two before that is when he found out, like the rest of us did. So Urban hasn't exactly been in the loop on all of these legal problems for Zach Smith because he was trying to shelter Urban from his own mistakes, which, you know, I guess you can say is noble to some degree. Uh, you know, it doesn't change the fact that Zach has had a lot of problems here. And, you know, I think some of you, you know, probably fairly are going to have your own opinions on Zach as an indiv individual, regardless of how he tries to cover his tracks to help Ohio State. You're going to feel some sense of frustration with how his life has at times spiraled out of control. And again, we don't know if that makes him a domestic abuser, but we definitely know he has his demons. And to his best abilities, I think he's tried to keep Urban in the dark as much as he could on some of these issues. But look, to bring this around in a circle here, what I'm trying to get at, I don't think that what Urban knows or what we've established he's known, I don't think there's any risk of further embarrassment as far as that is concerned. Now, there is one troubling part that I didn't talk a lot about yesterday on the special edition of the podcast, and that was the text messages involving Director of Football Operations Brian Boltolini. Um this was a, a disturbing part of the report, and, and I'm still trying to ask myself, how did they get this? Because the report basically goes back to August 1st and establishes that after Brett McMurphy's report hit Facebook, and this was the one that had the initial allegations of um, Courtney being choked by Zach and having the pictures, and I'm sorry, this was the one with the text messages involving uh, involving Shelly and uh, some of the other coaches' wives. And so the one where basically Shelly said she was going to have to pass this along to Urban, and it, to, to our knowledge, we don't know if that ever was. You know, they concluded in the report, and this is another thing I actually don't like about this report. I'm going to get off on a tangent here. I actually think this report was very unprofessional. I think they jumped to giant conclusions when they didn't have facts. They made assumptions that weren't borne out by facts. And this happened to be one of those situations. Uh, and, and we haven't even talked about, again, or at least today, we have not talked about the fact that they basically are making some really thin, stretching technicalities on how to apply the mandatory reporting. But one of the most unprofessional things I thought of the entire report was basically Urban and Shelley both said Shelley did not pass along the text message to Urban. Now, it's possible that that's not truthful. Uh, I tend to think there's actually a possibility that Shelley was telling the truth and Urban was telling the truth. And the reason I, th I think that is because it's possible that Shelley simply at that point in the timeline, had already thought to herself that maybe Courtney was not telling the truth. We know Courtney did not have a lot of people in her corner, and that's probably because they're just they did not deem her to be credible. And I'm not saying that she's lying, so don't mistake my words, but I don't think that they deemed her to be credible at that point in time. So from Shelly's standpoint, it's possible she could have been going along with Courtney trying to make her feel better, but she didn't feel that it was worth passing along to Urban. And, I, and I'm just 
guessing here. I don't know that that's what happened, but I think it's very plausible a scenario. But what the firm did is they took that information and they still concluded, we think that because Urban and Shelley are so close, because they have such a great relationship, we think that they discussed this. And, you know, I, I get that this is not a firm legal proceeding. It's not a document that has to be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. You know, the burden of proof here is 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 not very substantial. But I don't think it's professional or prudent for them to be making that kind of assumption in a document like this. I think they should stick to what has been established or strongly inferred. You know, if you want to take that legal standard, maybe the evidence points to this strongly, I'm fine with that. But I don't think in this particular case, I don't think the evidence bore that out. I think that was just a an allegation that they had no proof of, and I don't think it should have been in, in the report. But... So anyhow, this this report, a little flimsy from that, that standpoint. But that being said, you know, going back, circling this back around, what we know here, like the, the text messages is, is kind of interesting. How did they get this information? Because basically they're saying that on August 1st, after that report came out, Brian Boltolini had a conversation with Urban Meyer where he said this report, you know, was very damaging. We need to discuss this. And the conversation, according to the report, was uh, in the context of how Urban could go ahead and delete the text messages on his phone. And basically, they set the standard. And they said it was discussed about all wiping out all text messages on his iPhone that occurred previous to one year before that. And the investigators found when they took Urban's phone on August 2nd that, or I'm sorry, when they took his phone a few days later, but they went back, August 2nd was the first day where the conversations were still set. August 2nd of last year, that is, of 2017. Now, did they change the setting? Hard to say. I know some people have said that their phone was defaulted to one year of text messages, I don't know if Urban had a chance to change it. I don't know if uh, if that was because Boltolini told him to. We don't even know the context of the conversation. Was just this something that Boltolini was just suggesting and maybe he was trying to cover his own tracks for something? I don't know. We don't know what the mindset was of Urban Meyer. We don't know what the motivation was of Urban, Urban Meyer. But for one reason or another, they allegedly had this conversation about deleting text messages. Now, it's really fascinating to speculate on how they know this conversation existed because apparently it's not a text message conversation. They're stating it was a conversation had on the practice field on October, the morning of October 1st or the afternoon of October 1st. It, was, it actually did not make that clear. It said, the Facebook post by Brett McMurphy came out that morning, but it was not clear if that conversation happened immediately after or a little bit later in the day. But how did they get that information? Is that something Boltolini told in the interviews? I'm really not sure, but it's fascinating. And this looks bad, but again, we don't know if any text messages were actually deleted manually. We don't know if they changed the settings or if it had been like that on Urban's phone all along. So it's very dangerous for the media to go guessing on this, but they're going to. And Thursday night, Jeff Snook, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have been following his reports on Facebook, he said he's going to go out. He's already got a pub, uh, records request in with Ohio State. He's going to get all these documents. There are 40 interviews, so transcripts of 40 different witnesses in their testimony, over 60,000 documents. Uh, Snook already has the request in. He's already talked to Ohio State, and they're going to start releasing them in batches. And for the record, you may have seen this on my Twitter account, at KYLAM8. I'm going to do the same thing. I've already put the request in as of this morning. I have not yet heard back from Ohio State as I'm recording this, 
but I have put the request in and I'm going to see what I can find. If I can get these same documents, I'm going to pour through it. I've got my legal team, my research team. <laughs> I've got a research team set up to pour through, comb through all the documents and see what we can find. But the media, they're going to take the report of these text messages being del deleted and they're going to run with it. You know, guys like Brett McMurphy are not going to stop on this. They're like a hungry, dying pack of wolves that need food. They need fed really bad, and they're going to find it. And so I think it's probably a good idea to buckle up. And not necessarily that anybody is going to find anything, but there are going to be some embarrassing things to continue. I think the difference between this and Trestle is, you know, who knows if there's a smoking gun to disprove what we've already learned. And I don't think we're going to find that. But there may be something else out there with, you know, Jeff Snook has the right intentions. Jeff Snook is not going tabloid hunting. He's not looking for something that's going to expose or embarrass people necessarily. He's just looking for facts. And he's going to pour through this public information. And I think he has a good idea what he's looking for. Me personally, I don't know what I'm looking for. I'm going to go into this with an open mind. I just want to see what's what's behind the curtain. I want to see what is hiding. Are there patterns? Are there things that we should have picked up on and didn't? Uh, I'm going into this with a purely open mind, and I, I assume Jeff probably is too, but I, I also think he knows some things specifically he might be looking for. But there are reporters out there that are not going in with an open mind and they're not going in with the intent of making Ohio State and Urban Meyer look good. They're, they're simply looking for some kind of damning information that they can throw back out and make a story with. And so you got to buckle up just from the standpoint we're not done with the drama, in my opinion. I think we're just... Who knows how far along we are, but we're not done. Now, I don't think this is going to impact Ohio State. I don't think it's going to impact Urban Meyer. But I think you have some more rough days ahead. That report, look, it was not very flattering. I don't think it was very professional. And it's kind of interesting because Gene Smith's attorney Thursday night, Rex Elliott, made a post on Facebook. You may have seen this. And I'm not going to get into the report in detail. Basically, the, the, the gist is this. He said that Ohio State spent $500,000. They needed to make this look like they found something. He's basically suggesting they went into this, uh, you know, kind of with the whole analogy that I used yesterday, you know, the square peg, the round hole, making the crime fit the punishment. That's basically his assertion here. The only difference is he seemed to be insinuating that that was their plan all along. I think that's just something that was born out of the discussions. I think it didn't go well in the 12-hour meeting yesterday, and I think they finally decided that's the route that they had to take. Uh, I got the impression he thought that this was their plan all along. I'm not sure I agree with that, but I respect his opinion. He might have more information than I have. But he does agree with one major finding, and that is that the idea that this panel is recommending Urban Meyer and Gene Smith should have to issue a written report to compliance officials after they already had the information. It's silly. It, it doesn't make any sense. If the compliance officials already have that allegation documented, there is no reason whatsoever for anybody to have to go back and make another written report about it. I, I spoke to a couple of my friends that work in athletics that deal with this on a daily basis. Okay, Their, their jobs are as mandatory reporters where they would have to actually report stuff like this that, that comes up in their everyday uh, course of duties, whether it be sexual assault or domestic violence, any kind of, any kind of you know, violence or sexual misconduct they have to deal with it, and they would all tell me that if their bosses, you know, and specifically their compliance coordinators already had the information, there's no reason to re-report it. And the, the finding that this panel c concluded 
that despite their knowledge, they still have to issue a written report it is nonsensical. It, it really is silly, and that's all it boils down to. So I, I don't agree with the, the panel's findings. I think the report was reckless, and I understand Rex Elliott's point about this. But bottom line is there's more stuff out there. It's going to be found. Now, the good news here as far as the text message angle you know, look, these text messages, they're not getting recovered. Whatever was deleted, for if there even was a reason, if anything got deleted on purpose, we're never going to find it. And I'm not saying that in a way, well, you know, ha, 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 they got away with it. I'm not even sure there was anything to hide as far as a, a legal standpoint, from a legal standpoint. It, it could have been as simple as something embarrassing, something personal, something they didn't want to get out. Uh... Maybe it wasn't anything like that. I mean, Voltolini, I don't know what his motive was. If he was the one trying to get these texts deleted, maybe he was covering his own butt for something. I don't know. There's there's a thousand million different reasons it could be. But those text messages aren't coming back. They're gone for good. Those aren't going to be discovered. Is there anything else else out there within these 40 interviews or 60,000 documents that we have yet to discover? Well, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Uh, I hope that my record request is fulfilled. I hope that I get all these documents. I'll pour through. I'll see what I can find. I know Jeff Snook's going to look hard you know, through these documents. I'm hoping that I have, because I have some lending hands, some helping hands to help me go through these documents, maybe we'll find something. I don't know what I'm going to find. I'm not approaching this from a TMZ standpoint. But I would like to get the information, and we'll see what we can get out there. So I'm not saying Urban Meyer is in trouble, uh, but I am saying there's going to be more stuff come out, and that's why I'm doing it, because I know there are some reporters that are not going to stop digging. So I want to see if I can find patterns and if I can provide a fair and balanced counteraction to the stuff that's probably coming. But brace up, folks. There might be some more drama. It doesn't mean it's going to change Urban Meyer's job status, and I'm not saying that, and I actually don't think that's going to be the case. But I also don't think it's over. Anyhow, it is time. Let's talk some football and recruiting. We'll get Mark Gibbler. We'll get his take now. Mark Gibbler, recruiting analyst of the Buckeye Grove. It's time to go inside Ohio State recruiting and take a peek behind the scenes with Buckeye Grove recruiting guru, Mark Gibbler, and his magical orb of wonderment. They said it couldn't be done, but he's outdone himself once more. Back for another recruiting roundup. That's what I do. I drink and I know things. All right, Mark, let's rock and roll as you are in that state up north uh, coming to us from Detroit. Actually, now I think you said you're in, you're Tol- you're in Toledo, right? I'm, to- I'm in Toledo. Everyone will be very proud of me. I did not spend any gas <laughs> or hotel expenses in the state of Michigan. Um, everything is being purchased in the state of Ohio. <laughs> so I'm, I am in North Toledo. Well, there is a reason you are in Michigan, and uh, we will get into that here in a few minutes. But let's circle back because I think everybody knows what we're going to talk about first. I want to give you your shot since you haven't had a chance to weigh on weigh in on this for a couple of weeks. So, what are your first impressions of the sideshow that occurred at Ohio State on Wednesday, the twelve-hour board meeting, and and the subsequent suspensions of Urban Meyer and Gene Smith? Uh, Ohio State is not very good at these things. <laughs> that is my... That I is, bit, and that was why we were... Our, Kevin and I kept saying uh, a press conference is a bad idea, and that is the reason right there. It just... It always seemed to turn into a clown show whenever something like this comes up. You know, every several years or so, we seem to have an absolute clown show. They just have not... Uh, figured out how to do this properly. And and isn't it remarkable? Because Ohio State, for as great of a university as it is, and so many things they've done right, especially in the past 10 years, to grow and all these initiatives and everything they've done is is remarkable. 
but they can't get the PR right when it comes to athletics. I, I, I'm, I've never been able to grasp how they continually fail so bad at that. And it's not a lack of resources. I am sure the, the PR budget is, is strong. So I don't know. I, I'm just not sure. I mean, um, once it got that late, uh, I thought they should have probably just said, you know, apologize to the media and had them come back at, you know, 11 a.m. the next morning or something. If, if they were hell-bent on doing a press conference, uh, bring them back the next day, let everybody kind of get refreshed. Um, you know, I, I saw no value to having guys like, like especially uh, President Drake and, and Urban Meyer who were there all day, uh, stressful day, um, and then you're going you're gonna to kind of throw them to the wolves after a long day like that of, you know, I'm sure they were pretty mentally fatigued at that point. And, uh, it certainly showed. I mean, urban seemed like one of those prisoners you would see broadcast on Al Jazeera, right? I mean, he, he just was so, I mean, maybe there's a less colorful way to compare that, but he just seemed like, you know, his, his comments, you know, uh, you know, I trust our president. I mean, he repeated that like three different times and three different answers. He, and you could tell he just didn't believe anything he was saying. No, I didn't believe him either when he said that. But, um, you know, I'm sure there's, again, I'm sure there was some fatigue that came into play there at the end of the long day. But I, I just, at the end of the day, I just think he's not uh, pleased with any suspension at all. I, I think in his mind, he should be roaming the sidelines right now. And, and um, I think that was a very bitter pill for him to have to swallow. I touched earlier in the show on all of the, uh, I guess you can say rumors, but more I think it's just maybe baseless worrying by people about is this investigation going to continue on? You know, are the media going to keep digging dirt? Is this going to get worse? You know, the text messages and everything else that was unpleasant in the report. But I want to ask you about the other side of this. You know, there's the other half that, that are worrying. Is Urban Meyer going to bolt Ohio State? Do, do you see any reason to panic uh, any idea, any worry that you know, this has gotten to Urban in such a way that he would actually consider leaving because of it? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think if you, I think as we sit here today, I, I think he's certainly very upset. Um, but you know, once he gets through the suspension, gets back on the field, starts, you know, getting the competitive juices going. I think the I think this type of thing can can sort of wear off and eventually you, you sort of just get back to normal. Um, so you know I I don't know that I'd make a big bold proclamation that oh you know everything's perfectly fine and he's perfectly okay with all this. I, I don't think that's the case, but I just think that uh, time will ease the sting here a little bit. And um, I kind of I posted this on the board at some point during the week. I don't think there's. Th- I don't think there's that many jobs he would want at this point. I, I, th- I think the list, whatever people think the list of jobs he would want is, it's probably less than half of that many jobs. Um, uh, people were throwing out. I mean, I've on various, I've seen on Twitter, on other sites, and you know, just uh, like the message boards or whatever. You know, people throwing out jobs that he could leave for. My, like, he's not leaving for that one. He's not leaving for that <laughs> one. Not, you know, so it just, I don't, I don't think this will devolve into a really toxic situation you know unless of course we get uh more more reporting comes out here the next few weeks where and then ohio state's got to go back to the drawing board on what's the punishment appropriate but you know that's getting several steps ahead at this point so okay so he gets back to team uh, related activities on september 3rd of course we'll have to serve a two-game suspension even beyond that What's what do you think Ohio State's plan is going to be for him? Is he going to get back into the full brunt of practice, or do you think they'll just turn him loose on you know maybe getting back in touch with recruits at that point? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know that. I think the smart thing to do would be to kind of just let him slowly ease his way back into things and really let Ryan Day take command, especially assuming, you know, the first week, you know, goes smoothly. Um, and then sort of jump back into it when, you know, for Tulane week or whatever. But I think that's going to be, look, we've seen it, you know, we, we, we've, 
everyone sort of hinted when he first came to Ohio. I said, oh, you're going to get a dialed back Urban Meyer. I'm like, I don't think there's a dialed back Urban <laughs> Meyer. <laughs> I don't think that person exists. I think that's a figment of people's imaginations. You know, and, you know, now we're talking about, oh, he's going to be pissed. I'm like, I think Urban wakes up pissed just about every day. <laughs> so I, mean, I just think that's how he's wired. And I think it's going to be very hard uh, to keep him. I don't think he's going to. I, I, I don't think he's going to dip the toes into the pool. I think he's probably coming back in full force. But, um, yeah, I mean, certainly you would you would think uh, recruiting would would, would be um, also very much at the forefront just because of clearing things up with a lot of the prospects they're after right now and, and all that stuff that goes with that. One more question I want to ask you before we get into the recruiting angle of this. So I, I'm, I'm really curious. I have my theories, but I, I kind of want to hear yours. Do you think – Urban, in any way, shape, or form, starts calling people out, at the, even if it's subtly, or do you think he just bites his lip and lets it all go and, and keeps quiet about this? And by, by people, I mean, you know, reporters, certain reporters out there, do you think he verbalizes any of his feelings about any of this? I tend to think we get a more measured uh, urban, at least at first, um, and then kind of see how the dust settles and, you know, maybe down the road, there's a place and time for him to get his little barbs in. But I would, I would generally suspect he, uh, he keeps it pretty, pretty low key here. The, the, these, uh, next few weeks, because I, I don't think it's immediately going to get out of the news. I think, uh, a lot of people were very fascinated by some of the findings, and uh, we know of uh, one reporter who will not be stopping. So, <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, first reaction would be that I think he will uh, try and just kind of take his medicine here a little bit, but you never know. I don't think that certain reporter is going to be invited to any uh, Meyer family dinners in, in any time in the near future. I think we can. No, he's not. Get, he's not on the Christmas card list. No, we, we can safely rule that out. So. The recruiting aspect of all this, you had an update on the Horseshoe Lounge on BuckeyeGrove.com uh, Wednesday night. So what is, uh, it seems like the initial reaction from the recruits you spoke to, not surprisingly, were all positive. I, I, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, it may have halted Ohio State's recruiting momentum, but it, it, it hasn't hurt it any. Uh, if that is that an accurate way of putting it? Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think they had such incredible momentum, um, especially in 2020. And I think it stopped that, um, you know, obviously for the last few weeks. But I think, you know, it can start to pick up speed again pretty quickly. I, you know, a lot of these kids were really, they just wanted to make sure that Urban Meyer was still going to be the head coach at Ohio State. And as long as that was the case, most of these kids were going to still be very interested. And you saw that a lot with uh, Kendall Milton was one guy, a 2020 running back, kind of stated that, that you know, what a great program and, and coach Urban Meyer is and kind of mentioned the development aspect of that. And a guy like Mikhail Sherman, who is another five-star type of guy, and, you know, he, his feelings haven't changed. And it, it's just it, – it, it was a pretty predictable I, – I, everyone needed to read or I guess fans for their own sanity I guess needed to see what was what was being said by these kids. But it wasn't – I don't think anything was surprising in, in terms of the reaction. I think given what everyone had been saying the last couple of weeks, just waiting to see that Urban's you know still there, that this is – probably should have been expected, you know, the, the generally positive – um, feedback from from the um, the fact that Meyer will still be the coach. You know what's interesting for me is I think in most situations you see this occur. Uh, you know, kids don't wait this out. Even, even though the sensible thing is to just wait and you know see it play out and see what uh, ultimately happens. A lot of programs, you know, ki commits start jumping ship. The negative recruiting starts creeping into, into kids' minds, and and it really does hurt a lot of programs, even though it shouldn't. It does, but I think Ohio State just it goes to show how well they were doing with a lot of these guys that they were willing to wait this out like they did and not give in to the temptation of listening to all that negative recruiting that was going on. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, the Ohio State brand is still strong. I mean, yeah, some fans might roll their eyes at me right now, but, I mean, who's the last coach that was bad at Ohio State? I mean, yes, people got fired for overperformance, but, I mean, who was the last coach who was bad? I mean, everybody wins at Ohio State. It's just a matter of how big they win. So there, there's a branding thing there that helps them, I think. Um, but this kind of goes back to what we talked about almost at the very beginning of this, though. If, if there could ever be perfect timing for this, this was it. Okay, you're you're a 17 year old five star recruit. Your day right now is getting up at the crack of dawn, spending the entire morning and afternoon on a football field, taking a nap, probably spending a couple hours in the evening on the football field, going home and sleeping (laughs) and getting up and doing it again. And now, you know, now school has started um, for for many. Um, But there wasn't a lot of time for them to really even concern themselves with it. I mean, a lot of these kids were putting in 10, 12 hour days via school or two a days, fall camp for them, whatever it might be. And, you know, when they get home at night, oh, anything new with Urban, you know, kind of thing. I mean, it wasn't like they were at home playing video games all day, reading Twitter, you know, they were busy. So this was this was not getting the play with the recruits that I think it would have in like June. So ultimately the timing helps too, where there's so many things taking players minds off recruiting right now, where they're normally not going to be focused on recruiting anyway. And it just let them sort of, okay, well I'm going to focus on fall camp. And then when the decision comes out, the decision comes out. And then that's just really how it played out. Um, So, it was it was fortunate timing, I think, as well. I, I had an interesting question, and, and I, I assume because of the timing you just mentioned, because it was before the start of some of these kids' senior seasons, it's probably not a big deal. But I was curious how Ohio State was handling uh, evaluations. Were they were they looking at any new kids that they hadn't been already, or was all that pretty much and uh, you know just be halted to, to wait and see what happened with this? Yeah, I mean, I would say the. For like the, I mean, obviously the support staff and, and guys like Mark Pantoni are constantly worrying about stuff like that. But I, I could throw the same thing that we just talked about with the kids over with the assistant coaches. The assistant coaches right now are putting in insanely long days. I know that the NCAA has scaled back on the amount of practice time and in one day and things of that nature. But these coaches are still in the month of August. They're Football, 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 and recruiting is just not a big thing in August. It just, it's just not outside of maybe some evening phone calls and texts or what have you. Um, it's just not a big month for worrying about that stuff. Everyone, um, it's, it's like this four week period where everyone sort of stops caring about recruiting because the kids are getting ready for their season. And the coaches understand that while recruiting is the lifeblood of the program, if I don't get my current team ready to play, I'm not going to have a job next year. So everyone just sort of drifts away from it for a few weeks, and it just happened to line up almost exactly with this with this paid leave. I mean, didn't wasn't it August first that he went on paid leave? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was the very first day of the, of the dead period, I think, or you know, right yeah. around there. And and so it just you know it. it it really like lined up perfectly, I think, for everybody in terms, you know, you never want this to happen, but if it has to happen, you know, this this would be the time. So there was concern over one kid, a 2020 kid, Justin Rogers, and as luck would have it, uh, this is a good segue because you're, you just watched Oak Park, but Justin Rogers, a 2020 kid, there was some concern that maybe he was slipping away. He was a big Ohio State favorite early on, and, you know, recently Georgia had made up some ground, and there was some talk that he would make an announcement here in the first uh, next coming weeks. But you have some good news on that that front, correct? Yeah, I, I would interpret it as good for Ohio State. Um, so he he got us again. I mean, he 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 kind of did this in April, where um, a a tweet that would certainly seem to indicate a college commitment coming. Um, never materialized back in April, and he did this the other day. You know that he's going to commit soon, 
And he will be committing soon, but he will be committing to his all-star game of choice. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, with that said, Georgia has absolutely made up ground. Um, it, it, I think it's extremely tight right now between those two. And so because of that, you know, obviously if, if Georgia's the team that's got a little bit of momentum right now and, and Ohio State – you know, up until last night, did not have a head football coach. Um, you know, putting two and two together there, it was going to be difficult to see how that was going to be Ohio State. But as it turns out, <laughs> um, it it I, in talking to him tonight, it it sounds like he's still in that mindset of. I mean, he's been a guy that you know I'm taking five official visits, probably announced on signing day or at an all-star game, you know, this was something that was going to go for more than a year. Um, talking to him today, it got that vibe from him that that's what he's going to do. But I mean, you know, Paris Johnson was going to do that. And then one night just had an epiphany that he was going to commit to Ohio state 18 months before he said he was going to decide. So, uh, you never quite know. Um, you know, I, I was able to spend a, a quite a bit of time actually around the team today um, just because of the nature of the showcase and everything. So it, it wasn't just one of those one-game deals. So the, the team was just kind of out out and about um, after the game and things like that. So I was able to spend a lot of time around the team today. And, you know, there were people telling me they still think it, it, that Ohio State leads. Um, but it, it definitely – I kind of warned everybody on the message board a couple months ago. If you take this stuff really personally, this one may not be for you. (laughs) (laughs) This this may not be the one you want to follow (laughs) because he's, he's a big personality and uh, he certainly has fun with this. So uh, we'll see. We have any, um, any visits that any notable visits lined up thus far for opening weekend next week? Uh, nothing, you know, and, and to, to be honest with you, I, that has not been, um, a ton of the focus, I think for anybody the last couple of weeks, but, um, there's, a, there's supposed to be a group coming, I believe from Michigan. Um, I don't, it's not. It's expected to be the Oak Park guys, um, possibly Rayshon Williams. I, I've heard some some other names, but um, that that is something that I'll probably start confirming this week. Um, but as of this point, um, nothing nothing crazy. Um, the other kid from um, I'm blanking here. I'm, I'm getting my I'm getting my Michigan uh, 2020 receivers mixed up. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, like Rayshon Williams was a, was a maybe. Um, so, I mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I that'll, like I said, I, I will be tackling that probably Sunday, Monday and, and start throwing that list up here uh, midweek. Mark Gibbler, ladies and gentlemen, you can catch him on BuckeyeGrove.com. I promise, and we've got a great promo on Buckeye Grove right now. You get 100 days free uh, by using the promo. Check that out on our Twitter feed. Kevin Noon has it. Um, uh, I, I tweeted it earlier. You'll want to check that out. But uh, we are offering 100 days of premium access free. It's well worth it for Mark's stuff alone. So catch him on Twitter at BG. That is Mark with a C, not a K. Uh, Mark, I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll catch up next week and maybe get a, an updated visitor list. And, and we'll look forward to talking some uh, Ohio State, Oregon State football as well. Absolutely. Stretch runtime here at Unscripted Ohio. Kick up your feet as we cross the finish line with the Buckeye Beat, the latest in Ohio State news and notes. Kick the tires and light the fires, Big Daddy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, quick note here before we wrap up. I mentioned and I teased earlier in the show this new NCAA statistic, I guess we'll call it, an algorithm, a statistic, a measurement, whatever your descriptor for it. They have replaced the RPI starting this season, this college basketball season. They're going to use a new metric called the NCAA Evaluation Tool, or NET for short. Now, despite its very Orwellian name, and these guys don't come up with any cl- anything clever, do they? I mean, college football playoff was 
the most unoriginal thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Uh, NCAA evaluation tool is not much better, but I guess it, it does have a catchy acronym, NET, uh, which you can think of for basketball, you know, NET. Uh, so it, it has some intuitiveness when you shorten it, but NCAA evaluation tool is certainly not going to catch on. So I guess NET ranking will probably work a little bit. But basically the principle, let me, let me actually go back a little bit because here's some background. So basically last year, uh, two years ago, uh, I might add, the NCAA decided it was time to move into the 21st century as far as measurements were concerned. Because the RPI had been around in 1981. You know, back when they started the RPI, of course, the internet was not yet around. They needed an evaluation. You know, you got to remember in 1981, not a lot of college basketball was on television. You know, only a few national games were on each year. So you couldn't see, up until that point, they were relying on regional advisory committees to form opinions about teams. So they came up with this idea, let's start using a metric that we can compare all teams nationally to one another. And and that, that would help us guide the NCAA tournament selection process. Now, Power ratings were not entirely new back then. You know, the Dick Dunkel Index is a famous power power rating that had been around for many years, even at that point. So the concept was not entirely new, but the NCAA had not been using it. So the RPI had been around since 1981. And finally, with the advent of all of these metrics that are very mainstream now, like Ken Pomeroy's ratings, Jeff Sagarin has been had, you know, has had ratings out for years. Dean Oliver was responsible for help getting the BPI off the ground on ESPN. Uh, There are a lot of power ratings out there that are very well known. And finally, the NCAA said it's time to start utilizing analytics in our selection process. And they've done a good job of of modernizing and transparent, you know, making it more transparent as well as modernizing the selection process the last few years. So they started to look into the idea of developing a model. Now, quick little story side note here uh, that I'm very proud of. They had an open forum that they invited some of these statisticians and some media members to a few years ago where they were talking about ways to incorporate statistics into the process. And I am proud to say I had a matrix at that time that I said that I had been doing on my own with a couple of friends that basically took the concept of the RPI and accounted for the differences in a home win versus a road win, for instance. So with the RPI, if you're measuring wins and losses, beating the number 50 team on the road is actually better than beating the number 30 team at home. So I came up with a little matrix that basically did an equivalency chart that showed how, based on uh, empirical data over five years, how winning at home or road would change the difference you know, beating a team within the RPI. Having that matrix, I happen to mention the idea to somebody that was at that forum that weekend, and the NCAA uh, basketball uh, director, David Warlock, actually reached out to me. I provided that copy, and lo and behold, you may remember last year the NCAA started using the modern, modern um, or I'm sorry, the modified uh, rankings categories to stack up teams now. So instead, it used to be 1 through 50. If you beat one th- teams, you played 1 through 50, and then 51 through 100, 101 to uh, uh, 200, and then 200 plus. Well, they kept that same you know, thought process for neutral court games, but they changed it on a sliding scale to, inclu- to factor in that games at home and games on the road were different. That was my idea. I'm very proud to say that. That was my moment of fame. Anyhow, so back to the point, they wanted to incorporate statistics into the process, so they decided last year they would test a few things. As it turns out, they were using some of these other analytic power ratings like Pomeroy and Sagarin, but then they went ahead and added in their own metric that they were testing. It turns out that was net. So the premise is this. They're going to utilize net for this upcoming season. It's going to replace RPI when they measure teams' wins and losses and measure teams against each other, NET is going to replace RPI in those evaluation tools. So NET is going to rely on things such as strength of schedule, 
game location, game results, margin of victory, uh, capped at a 10-point scoring margin, and then offensive and defensive efficiency. It sounds like a hodgepodge of, of statistics, and in some degrees, it really is. It's not going to be intuitive necessarily. But, you know, like in baseball, OPS, as simple as it is, you know, on-base percentage plus slugging, it's not really an intuitive statistic, but it works. It tests strongly in correlation and regression. You know, you, you test it, there is a strong connection there. And this is the same way. It's not going to be intuitive. It's not going to be simple like OPS, but it's not intuitive, but it works. They tested it, I guess, throughout the season. They used a bunch of game results, end of the season results, including NCAA tournament, and they tested against these results, and they went through the process until they could get it as accurate and without as much, with, with as little error as possible in their predictive results. So this is going to be something that they tested they worked very hard over the course of the last season. And so long live net. RPI is dead. Long live net. So that's interesting little basketball note there. I hope you found that fascinating. Uh, if you want to talk basketball or, of course, the Urban Meyer stuff, hit me up on Twitter at KYLAM8. That is going to do things for us for today. Remember on Monday, it is game week. We will have Ross Fulton on to discuss the Buckeyes and Beavers, Oregon State, next Saturday, September 1st. It will be game week, so we'll talk to Ross about that on Monday. Very much looking forward to it. You can catch the show Monday and Friday on BuckeyeGrove.com, on the archives, Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, and, of course, we host on SoundCloud. Thanks for joining me this Friday, everybody. Have a great weekend, and go Bucks. You can get new episodes of Unscripted Ohio on Mondays and Fridays exclusively at BuckeyeGrove.com or anytime on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things Ohio State.